use crowdfunding to change the world. In today's episode, I'm joined by Thomas Umstadt, who is here to show you how to use crowdfunding in a way that would help you build community while creating a financial cushion for your business. You'll learn the difference between the three types of crowdfunding, why crowdfunding is an inexpensive place to fail, and the best and worst practices for how to use different crowdfunding platforms such as Kickstarter and Patreon. Thomas Umstadt travels the world speaking at events that help creatives, creative people grow famous and rich. Thousands of creators have attended his popular workshops, breakout sessions, and online events. As a podcaster, he hosts, hosts the novel marketing podcast, The Creative Funding Show, and Liberty, Liberty Buzzard. He currently serves as the CEO of Author Media. Today's episode is sponsored by How to Conquer Your Bullshit with CPR, my free training that will help you bring your message to the masses. Sign up for the free training at rubyframon.com forward slash CPR. And finally, whether you're new to this podcast or you're a loyal thought leader, please make sure that you take a moment to drop a rating and review on iTunes. Now it is time to start crowdfunding with Thomas Umstadt. Hey, Thought Leaders, I am back, and I'm back with another guest who I met at the New Media Summit in Austin last September, Thomas, and Thomas blew me away. We had this day after event, post-event mastermind, where all the icons of influence got to talk, and everything that came out of Thomas's mouth was gold, like gold in terms of how to really boost the business, boost you know, your podcast, everything. I didn't necessarily know how to implement all of that, just so you know, Thomas, but he <laughs> is a pocketbook of wisdom. So I'm super excited to have him here. Welcome to the show, Thomas. Thanks, Ruby. I'm excited to be here. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a topic that I have yet to talk about on the podcast, which makes me even more excited. We're going to talk about crowdfunding and crowdfunding to change the world, which excites me even more. So tell us a little bit more about this. So in the olden days, if you had an idea of something that you wanted to bring to the world, you had to get permission from people with money in order to bring that idea to the world. And typically right. these were like men in suits with lots of money and you'd yeah. make two or three phone calls, you get two or three meetings. And if they said, yes, you're good. If they said no, you're out of luck. And mm -hmm. uh, so Edison's famous for inventing the light bulb. Do you know where he was when they first deployed his electrical system and light bulbs? Was he in the houses of the very first people getting light bulbs turned on? No, he was at, <laughs> I think it was JP Morgan Ch or Morgan Chase, one of those banker guys, because yeah. it was more important that he maintained the relationship with the guys with money mm -hmm. than he maintained the relationship with his actual customers, mm. because they were the ones who determined if the world had electricity and light or not. Right. Um, really exciting is that that is now changing. Now, uh, if Edison had the idea for the light bulb, he could go to people like, hey, would you like electric light? And people could pre-order light bulbs uh, through a system like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and he mm -hmm. can use that money from people's pre-orders to actually bring his idea to the world. And that's what we're mm -hmm. seeing with lots of famous inventions. So if you have an Apple Watch, you may be like, mm -hmm. where did the Apple Watch come from? Well, Apple stole the idea from a company named Pebble, it was like, we're gonna create an electronic digital smartwatch. And it was like, right. that's been tried, no one wants that. And they're like, no, we think that people want that. And they're like, nobody's gonna fund that. They couldn't get VC money, and at least not very much. And uh -huh. so they posted it on Kickstarter and they raised like $10 million from right. people pre-ordering uh, Pebble watches and invented an entire product category. And that's the positioning, right? The positioning for crowdfunding is, is like you can pre-order. And the pre-orders count towards the actual production of the whatever it is. But then what if they don't make the, you know, the, the budget or the donation? Like, I, they have limits, right? How, do, how does that work? <laughs> yes, that's a great question. So Kickstarter is all or nothing. So if you need a million dollars to run a factory uh -huh. uh, or to rent a factory to make your product, you, what you don't want is to only raise $500,000 and then have to be you know, in debt for $500,000 if there's no demand. Or even worse, you, have, you raise $10,000 and you have to raise the rest, yourself, rest yourself. So what Kickstarter does is if you don't hit your goal, uh -huh. no one is charged and you get no money and they take no fee. So failure is very safe in Kickstarter right. world. 
You're, you're okay. not losing millions of dollars, which is actually the other reason why I really like crowdfunding for entrepreneurs is that if you're using lean startup methodologies where you're wanting to test a minimum viable product before you invest a lot of time and effort, uh -huh. your Kickstarter campaign or your Indiegogo campaign could be your minimum viable product. Because it's right. one thing to ask your friends, hey, do you think my idea is good? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's another thing to ask your friends, hey, would you like to pre-order this idea that I just had? And they're like, oh, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. And they tell all their friends. Mm -hmm. You get to know how much demand there is for your product. Mm. So it's a great gauge for us to use in terms of, like, let's figure out if there actually is a demand. Um, so what – I feel like there's so many platforms out there now for crowdfunding. That's right. So there's kind of three different kinds of uh, crowdfunding, if I could put them into these kind of very broad categories. You have rewards-based crowdfunding where people give you money in exchange for a reward, which is typically the product, maybe some other products that you've made. Mm -hmm. So uh, the classic example is you're a musician and you want to make an album. You need $10,000 for studio time. People pre-order your songs, you, you know, for $10, you get the digital songs for $20, you get the CD. And if you sell enough, you make the album and everyone gets the music. That's the okay. classic rewards based model. Okay. Uh, the second is equity based crowdfunding, which is where people are getting a tiny percentage of your company and mm -hmm. um, they actually get ownership. So this is more like getting angel investors in your company. But right. instead of, you know, five sharks on Shark Tank, it's like yeah. 5,000 angel investors who are all kind of each own a little piece of your company. And Got it. the legality of that is frustratingly ill-defined. Uh, so there, Congress said, hey, make this legal, and the guidelines and regulations are still a little unclear. So some of the platforms, you have to be a accredited investor to do angel uh, slash equity-based crowdfunding. And that's not really what I'm passionate about because right. getting wealthy people to invest in your company has happened for a long time. And mm -hmm. with, with that model, you're still looking for $10,000 plus. Like you're not yeah. selling $5 worth of your company. Right. The third kind, which is what I'm most excited about right now, is like a subscription-based crowdfunding model. And so uh, this is something like Patreon where people are okay. becoming members. They're becoming patrons of what you're creating. And right. So going back to that band, you know, maybe you need $10,000 to make your 12 songs in the studio, but with a patronage model, maybe you release a song every month and everyone who donates money to you gets that month's song. And this Got is more for like the YouTuber who's creating videos and you back the YouTuber, you back the artist or an author. Some people right. release chapters of their books that way. And what's nice about this is that it's very steady income. Yeah. So and you, what's interesting about that, sorry, what's interesting about that is I'm seeing more and more entrepreneurs leading, leaning into Patreon because it doubles as like a community builder. That's right. One of the things I love about Patreon, and we talk about this on my podcast, Creative Funding Show, is that it is one of the few hate-free places on the internet um, because the only way for someone to be a part of your Patreon community is to pay money. Right. And if there's one thing I know about trolls, they will not pay money. In fact, they don't put in hardly any effort. So if you don't have any show notes for your <laughs> podcast episode and they have to listen to your podcast to give you criticism, that's too much effort. They'll go criticize somebody else. Right. But they're definitely not going to give you money. And so you can create for your fans, focus on thrilling your fans, people who are giving you money. And that is, is very rewarding and it's very fun. And it takes some of the stress out of it. Because if you made $5,000 last month on Patreon, you're probably going to make $5,000 this month. Right. Uh, it's much more consistent. Whereas with Kickstarter, you really have no idea if the campaign's going to succeed or fail and you don't know how much it's going to succeed. Uh, yeah. So now it is. Go, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Thomas. So uh, Kickstarter is better if you're making a physical product, right? Like if you're yeah. wanting to invent a cooler that's got speakers and Wi Fi and a mm -hmm. battery for charging your iPhone that somebody actually did. They're like, we're going to make the most amazing cooler. It's like <laughs> the cooler of the future. And we're going to sell a million dollars worth of these. Uh -huh. um, and we want to know how much demand there is. Kickstarter is great because if you're going to a factory for a thousand units or a factory for 10,000 units, that really affects a lot of the manufacturing decisions that you're going to make. It affects mm -hmm. those conversations. It affects your per unit cost. And it's nice to know, Hey, we already have money for 10,000 of these coolers. We can probably afford to get 20,000 of them made in the factory. And then we'll go and get them in Walmart and places like that. So for a project like that, Kickstarter Indiegogo is better, like a technology product. Mm -hmm. Or something like a podcast where it's ongoing, mm -hmm. or something a little more creative, Patreon's better. It's more of a patronage model or where it's a service that people continue getting. So some people will do their whole coaching program 
through Patreon, where like they use Patreon as the technology front end for their mm -hmm. coaching. They have the different levels of the coaching and yeah. uh, they don't have to invest in an expensive website. They just do it all through Patreon. Oh, interesting. What you said earlier about Patreon where, you know, so people subscribe and they make these monthly payments and then they receive, like you gave the example of the band and then they receive the song. So if it's, for example, a podcast, I mean, the episode would be live everywhere anyways. Yeah. So this is what's cool about Patreon. Okay. It actually has the technology to create a patrons only podcast. Where, so we have with Novel Marketing, one of my podcasts, we have a Patreon page and we have a special monthly Q&A episode that only patrons get where they send in their questions and we answer it. And you have to be a patron to subscribe, but it goes through your normal podcasting app. So if you use Apple Podcasts, you can mm -hmm. subscribe in there. And if they stop paying, they stop getting the episodes. And oh. Patreon handles all of that technology. Uh, you can also do patrons only videos or we have patrons only coupon codes for our courses. Um, there's a lot of different rewards that you can do. And like what kinds of rewards do for what audiences is one of the things we talk a lot about because mm -hmm. you know, what you create really affects the kind of rewards uh, that you provide. The biggest reward may just be putting somebody's name uh, at the end of your YouTube video. <laughs> like people right. get very excited like, oh my gosh, I'm in R Ruby's video. I love her so much. And now, I'm, <laughs> I, you know, she mentioned my name on her podcast. Uh, whereas for other people like I don't care about that I just want stuff <laughs> so yeah so patreon I want to stay on patreon right now because I feel like this is a hot topic and a lot of people are talking about patreon and I'm sure that there's ways that we should not be using it where it's not effective um, I know people who have been bringing in like you said 5,000 I know people have been bringing in thousands per month and I also know people who are bringing in like $20 a month so what are the most effective ways then to utilize Patreon as someone who is like an entre uh, entrepreneur or in the online space? What's the best way for us to utilize that? Yeah, so this key to any crowdfunding platform, whether it's Patreon or Kickstarter, is the same. And it's actually in the name. It's to have a crowd first. So if you don't have a crowd of people, and we're talking like hundreds, if not thousands, preferably tens of thousands of people who are already fans of what you do. If you right. don't have that first, it, none of these tools are really gonna work very well. A lot of people Got think, it. oh, uh, all I need is a good idea and Kickstarter or Patreon is gonna go out and introduce my idea to people. No, mm. that, that's not what those tools are for. People need to already be on board with your idea. Uh, you, you need to already have a plan of getting your message out. That, that's not what it's for. It's for the money problem, not for the fan problem, mm -hmm. as they'd say at Patreon. So that's the first thing. Oftentimes when people are struggling, it's because they don't really have enough fans. So they're launching their campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have a lot of fans and they're still not getting good money, the next thing to look at is how are you talking to your uh, fans about what you're creating and what are your rewards? So you want to have uh, good incentives, good rewards that get people excited. Uh, for one of my clients, she has a podcast and she has this brick wall uh, that she stole the idea uh, from like universities, right? You uh -huh. fund the library and you get your name in a brick. And she's like, oh, I can do that. So she, in a like graphics editing program, put this brick wall and she etches people's names in the brick. And, and so if they donate $10 a month to her podcast, their name is on every know blog posts for each podcast with their name etched in one of the bricks oh and wow a real fun but also very easy thing for her to do once a month she updates the bricks and you know takes the names off of people who stop donating and adds the new names of the new folks because there's a churn some people come and some people go uh, so that's for her has worked really well uh, mm -hmm. having a credit to patreon backers at the end of a youtube video can work really well um, having a list of patrons in your book or on your album uh, mm -hmm. works really well the other way to do it is to have tangible rewards that are something of substantive value. Uh, so with Novel Marketing, we've created lots of courses and our patrons get 50% off of all of our courses. So it's kind of like oh, a wow. Sam's Club membership type plan. Yeah. And it's, it's been a great way of kind of cross-selling because often when somebody becomes a patron, one of the very next things they do is they go on and buy one of our courses. And mm -hmm. then we're getting you know a little bit of money every month, but they're also have uh, we've broken that money barrier and changed yeah. the nature of our relationships. We're not just giving them free stuff all the right. time. Yeah. That's so interesting. I feel like there's so many then creative ways for us to utilize that as entrepreneurs, because quite frankly, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm in the online space. I definitely have an offline presence and a lot of my business is offline, but we, we fluctuate. 
you know, we don't, we don't, a lot of us aren't in that place where we have that steady stream of what we can depend on. And what I love the most about Patreon is it, it brings your, it feels like it brings your community in and makes them feel as though they are a part of something. And what I've learned in the work that I do with thought leaders is it's so important as leaders to create something that people can be a part of. That's how movements are created. And that's how people feel as though they are of something of significance. They get the recognition um, and they're more energetically invested to what it is that they're a part of. So I think it's genius. Um, yeah, I think it's yeah. genius. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've launched a bunch of books on Kickstarter and mm -hmm. I found that the people who donate the most to make the book happen are also the most energetic about spreading the word about the book. After mm. it out. So one of my big Kickstarter backers, for, I wrote a book on dating and relationships, uh, mm -hmm. basically a viral blog post that I wrote. And one of uh, my backers bought a case of these books on his own. I think he backed at the level where he got a case. And uh -huh. you know what he did with his case of books? He mailed them to journalists. Oh my <laughs> God. These like press interviews from this PR person that I had who paid to buy the books. And I was like, okay, wow. your next box of books is on me. <laughs> Send them to whoever you want. And I got interviewed by all kinds of different media. I had a radio show come to my office to do an interview. Uh, based off of this person who who paid to help make the book happen. Yeah. You know, his name is in the back of the book and he he was invested in seeing the book happen. Like he was mm -hmm. wanting to see the book ha happen in such a way where, he, you know, there's this uh, Bible verse where your money is there, your heart will be also. Uh -huh. and there's a lot of power in that. <laughs> Once people are yeah. investing and in helping you make something, they do exactly as you said, have a sense of ownership. And that sense of ownership makes them want to see the project succeed. So if your Kickstarter campaign is 60% funded, you know what the likelihood is that will go on to be 99% or 100% funded? It's what? a 99% chance. <laughs> your backers are so invested in you that yeah. they will go out and you know, shake the bushes to right. find that final 40%. Uh, and I had uh, one of my Kickstarter campaigns, it was for a WordPress plugin. And uh -huh. some guy in Germany was tweeting at everyone on uh, Twitter with WordPress in their bio and asking them to back our campaign. He was so excited about it. And I wow. was like simultaneously like honored and also horrified. I'm like, right. you're like, you're spamming Twitter. Don't do that. <laughs> he's at replying. He spent like an hour at replying people. But on the other hand, I was like, man, this guy's excited. Like yeah. he just want our campaign to succeed. He wants it to thrive. And without us even asking him, he's doing all of this effort to see it. Succeed. Right. So it's also then a good way um, to create those or uncover, discover those raving fans. That's exactly right, because you, you know how much they're backing. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we do on Creative Funding Show is we interview people with Patreon pages and we talk to them. And I talked with this one author and she has four or five people who are backing at her $100 a month level. Mm -hmm. And I think it's five people backed at the $100 a month level and she put all these rewards together. You know, it's this really nice package. Yeah. But of the five people, three of those people have never bothered to email her and like give her the information she needs to send them the rewards. Because wow. they don't care about the rewards. They just want to support the work that she's doing. Yeah. And see that she keeps making it. It's not about the rewards for them. And that's one of the things we found is that for a lot of people who back a Kickstarter campaign or a Patreon campaign, it's not really about the rewards. Mm -hmm. It's about having that sense of ownership and, you know, being a patron of the arts, right? When you donate to your, the local symphony in your town, you're not doing it because you really want to hear Box Concerto. You can listen yeah. to Box Concerto anywhere. Uh, it's because you want to, you know, encourage the arts it's kind of like supporting a charity or supporting the arts but in a slightly more businessy way mm. that this also um brings up the fact that i'm sure that there is a way for all of this to go very very wrong as well in terms of um me being the entrepreneur and no not going in prepared because from my perspective from what you're sharing it feels like like value is really a differentiator. What is the value of what you have to offer, um, especially with things like Patreon? Um, so, what are some things that we need to avoid doing? So, with with Patreon, there's not a lot, or at least not yet. There haven't been a lot of controversies <laughs> of okay. like Patreon campaigns that were a huge disasters. Right. Um, that does happen with Kickstarter. Yeah, I bet. Uh, where there are big <laughs> public disasters. And the biggest uh, disasters are people doing a poor job budgeting how much it's going to cost to make their thing. So oh. they think, oh, yeah, $100,000 should be plenty to make, you know, 
a thousand units of our board game or whatever. Right. And it turns out when they go to place the order, they're the, you know, printing companies like actually we need $250,000. And they're like, well, I don't have an extra 150,000. And so the whole campaign is a bust and they've already mm -hmm. spent a lot of the money and they can refund people and everyone's unhappy. Mm -hmm. That happens from time to time. And there's always a risk for backers backing a Kickstarter campaign that the campaign will go bust and they won't mm -hmm. get the reward. So they will, uh, the other thing that's very common is uh, they think that it will t go faster than it really does. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so impatience. Uh, yeah, you're right. there are Kickstarter campaigns that I have backed years ago. I'm still waiting to get the rewards for. In fact, uh -huh. it's kind of like random Christmas. It's like everyone's right. in the package. I'm like, what on earth is this? I'm like, oh yeah, back in 2015, I backed this project on Kickstarter, and they're just now mailing it to me. You know, four wow. years later. Uh, and, and that's just how it goes with, yeah. with Patreon. There's less risk of that because it's this ongoing basis. Um, you're only giving people one month's worth of value. And so it's a little bit safer And the rewards tend to be kind of lower scale rewards. Like we'll mm -hmm. mention your business on it. We'll give you a shout out on the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Almost like selling like small sponsorships. Yeah. yeah. So that's um, probably the biggest mistake is for Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. For Patreon, uh, the biggest mistake is not uh, coming up with interesting enough rewards. So failure with Patreon tends to be very quiet. When people come, yeah. they don't see anything that's interesting, and then they leave. And, and then they leave, yeah. Coming up with the right rewards really depends on your brand and what you're offering. And uh, you, the other mistake that's kind of related to that is creating rewards that are too exhausting. Mm. If somebody's paying you five dollars you need to only be giving them five dollars worth of energy and preferably less than that right you need to right a profit off of that so you need to be doing high scale things uh, so a band who gives out an mp3 if i have a hundred patrons or a hundred thousand patrons giving them a, an mp3 through patrons the same amount of work so it scales mm -hmm. really well but if i write them a handwritten thank you note and suddenly i have a hundred thousand people to write a handwritten thank you note right i have just destroyed my hand for the rest of my life <laughs> <laughs> so now that's a that's an extreme example but yeah. that sort of thing does happen the famous uh, instance is a indie film uh -huh. uh, if you backed for a hundred dollars uh -huh. you got to have a skype call with the producer oh wow and something like a thousand people backed at that level and so the producer of the um movie for the next mm -hmm. year instead of producing the film was doing one uh, was doing oh Skype calls with all of these random people which if you're an introverted person yeah that, that is like the worst possible outcome right <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare yeah it is it's like a, a living nightmare it's like I will pay you a hundred dollars to not have to talk to you on the phone right so kind of keep in mind you know this could fail and no one's interested but you also want to think about what happens if it goes crazy what happens if yeah it mentions it and a thousand people back at this level can i handle it and yeah both kickstarter and patreon allow you to limit reward levels so okay i i, I will do this amazing thing but only for five people right. and that way it sells out and you're like oh my gosh it sold out i need to back one of the other levels before it sells out too it creates some scarcity and some urgency yeah it's so so when it comes to books because i've seen a lot of people crowdfund their books um what would be because i've seen people do it on patreon but i've also seen them use other i know there's like author related crowdfunding platforms but like is kickstarter something you would use for a book so i've crowdfunded uh, almost no over half a dozen books on kickstarter successfully okay. Uh, one book uh, was for an author who wrote a memoir about overcoming sexual abuse. It was a mm -hmm. beautiful memoir traditionally published, and she wanted to write a how-to book on how to overcome sexual abuse. And right. she went to her publisher. They said no. She went to her other publisher. They said no. She's written dozens of books at this point. Uh -huh. And she goes to other publishers, and they all say no. And she's like, I know there's a demand for this book. This is right. before Me Too happened. Yeah. And so she goes to her so she, she, we together posted it on Indiegogo uh -huh. and she raised $25,000 for her wow. book. And so she was able to print it offset. So she able to get boxes of books. She's able to donate to women's shelters or give away inexpensively. She's not paying as much per copy. She's uh -huh. able to get an audiobook produced and really do it in a very high quality way. Um, the key though is to have an email list. So it wasn't because she was writing a book about sexual abuse. It's because she had already had a track record in an audience of people who knew, knew her, they liked her, and they trusted her as an expert on that topic. And so when she mm. sent out an email to her 10,000 people, they flooded to her campaign and donated the money. So you have to be Got faithful it. with the little things. People aren't right. going to pay to read your book if they won't read your blog for free. 
Right. And I mean, I think that's something that a lot of people miss is that aspect of keeping your community engaged and feeling as though that they are appreciated. Yes. And uh, one tip with Patreon, especially, but also with Kickstarter, there's something very powerful about a personal thank you. So if somebody mm. first becomes a patron, you send a note. It's like, oh my goodness, Ruby sent me an email. She said, thank you for being, uh, suddenly you have that connection. Yeah. And often when I do that with my patrons, the very first thing they do is they send back questions or comments on the show. Mm-hmm. And that may lead to topics or future episodes. We hardly ever come up with episodes anymore. Our fans come up with episodes for us. <laughs> questions, they're like, we should do a show on that. And we're like, surely we've done a show on this topic. And they're like, oh, Oh, we haven't okay or we've done three episodes on this topic and people are still asking questions so we need mm-hmm. bringing somebody else to talk about it more and and that's really rewarding for us yeah so w- with the online entrepreneurs um if someone's just seeking to get a little boost in like a little extra padding so that they can continue to put their work out there is that how you can just position it? Can you actually position it as like, hey, I would love you to back my work so I can continue doing this? Or is there different ways that we should be positioning this ask? So it depends on what you're selling. Okay. Uh, if you're a novelist, uh, Patreon may work better uh, because you can write short stories, which... Got it. In, so let's say you're writing a series of novels. Uh-huh. You'd be writing short stories in the story world that your novels take place with uh-huh. the same characters and only patrons get access to those short stories. Okay. Uh, and that can be really powerful. So it's like in between the books, what's happening, right? There may be some minor characters that your fans really love. Like, oh, you want to find out more about this character? Well, you got to get the patrons. Kind of like uh, Coulson in the Agents of she- or, uh, in the Marvel films, right? Uh-huh. The kind of man. Yep. I don't know if you're familiar, but he got yeah. his own TV show. And I'm like a huge fan of that TV show. <laughs> and it's not as you know big or high budget as the actual Marvel films, yeah. but it's kind of more of this minor character. And if you like that minor character, there's more of him. You can do that sort of thing with Patreon easier than you can with, with Kickstarter, right? It's like, right. oh, back my Kickstarter, you'll get these six short stories. That has a less of an appeal because if somebody loved the last three short stories monthly, man, they're going to stick around, right? And you can tell a story in little piece by piece. Other novelists will tell the story over time and patrons are the first ones to get access. Maybe patrons get early access. So they can still okay. get feedback. Right. Uh, another really easy reward is I'll name one of my characters after you. <laughs> one of my cities after you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, people, uh, this was uh, his name is Scott Sigler, I think his name. Uh, he had, writes these horror books, high mm-hmm. body count. And he names the people who die after his like, top oh my God. And top <laughs> so like, you want to die in my book? You know, it's, it'll cost you 20 bucks. And be like, yeah. oh my gosh, that was me. I died in scene one. Right. So that sort of thing uh, can work really well and be really fun. It adds a sense of whimsy and, and a sense of it. Um, again, that sense of ownership, right? Because if you mm-hmm. give people an early version and they're giving you feedback and you incorporate that feedback into the book, so that the final version is different, uh, suddenly they're, they're more involved. And I did this for my nonfiction book, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a research team and uh, they g- gave me feedback and we had debates in Google Docs. Over oh, wow. Chapters. And that was the most fun aspect of the whole writing process. Yeah. Were these epic debates we were having on the topic and what ended up was a much stronger book mm. than if I hadn't have gone through that process. Right. So really, uh, so say for instance, it's a podcast and um, you're doing it on Patreon. The Patreons then, you know, you offer something that only they get because everyone's going to get the podcast episodes that get released every month. But if you become a Patreon, then you also get access to X, Y, Z, and then you create different tiers. Like, so if you decide to be a $5 a month subscriber, this is what you get, $10, $100, et cetera. Exactly. So some examples, if you're a a podcaster, let's say it's an interview based podcast. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets the first 40 minutes of the interview for free, but we have a special after interview that only the patrons get for free. You record an hour long episode, you give the first 40 minutes, you make Mm -hmm. it complete. But for people who want more, which are only going to be hardcore fans, most people are like 40 minutes is enough for me. Right. But the people who want more are probably the ones who are willing to pay for more. Uh, The other way to do it. And it's important to have a basically no reward or very light reward, lowest level, where it's mm-hmm. like you are helping to create the thing that you're already getting. It's kind of like PBS, right? What do you get for funding P- 
PBS, you get PBS, right? If you like Mr. Rogers' <laughs> Neighborhood, like if you like Sesame Street, and uh -huh. you like Riverdance, you donate to PBS. And it's not like you're backing for the prizes. And so uh, some of the top podcasts, actually, they have a lo lowest level where it's just like, hey, thanks for making the show happen. Or we're ad-free because we have these backers. So you're kind of like backing so that everyone gets the show ad-free. So the only oh. ad is please become a podcast. The, um, there's a Tech News Daily podcast that does this, uh -huh. Tom Merritt. And uh, uh -huh. he's very famous in the, in the Patreon world. And he doesn't have commercials. He just has patrons, which is great. Because yeah. who advertises on a tech news podcast? Tech right. companies. And if you're a journalist trying to hold tech companies accountable, and they're the ones who are paying your <laughs> bills, it's really hard to hold yeah. them accountable. But if the consumers of the technology are the ones who are paying your bills, mm -hmm. you can be as hard on Apple for their crazy idea or Blizzard for their crazy idea as you want to be without any fear of repercussions from the company. So it changes the power dynamic, actually, a little bit of news type podcasts. And so that's another aspect of it. Uh, right. And, and there's a lot of creative ways of doing this. And uh, every time I have a new guest on Creative Funding Show, uh -huh. I learn some new technique from some new podcaster of how yeah. they're doing it. But uh, that's what's so fun about it. So it's very new. There's no like, here is the one way to do it that will work. Right. Out. Yeah. Um, so listeners, if you want more ideas, check out Thomas's podcast. And I'm going to put all these links in the show notes, just so you know. Thomas, I, my wheels are spinning right now. Like I am getting so many ideas. Thought leaders, don't be surprised if by the time this episode airs, I also have a Patreon account. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm spinning with ideas. Um, wow. I, I feel like I just want to say to you, Thomas, is there anything you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> so you what, I have a newborn in the house and right. uh, we got this book called uh, Baby 411. It's like this like encyclopedia of like things for babies. And I'm constantly like flipping through this. I'm like, is this something to be concerned about right. or is this normal? So, <laughs> what a great book title. <laughs> it, it's brilliant and so helpful. <laughs> like, oh, wait. So I, I won't go into the details, but right. uh, I, we've had more poop conversations. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're than parents. usual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gone up significantly when you have a little baby in the house. Well, Thomas, do you have any final thoughts to share with our audience? Uh, the final thought is to uh, don't be afraid to take risks and, mm. and to try it. The biggest reason why people don't try Kickstarter or Patreon, one of these crowdfunding platforms, is because failure is a little public, right? Everyone right. can see you if your Kickstarter succeeded or not. And that is what keeps them from trying. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of guarantee their own failure. And for a long time, I never had a failed Kickstarter campaign. I was very proud about the fact that I was like 100% of my campaigns succeeded. But I'll tell you, one of the campaigns that succeeded really should have failed. We set the goal too low. The product was not, didn't have a big enough audience. We, everyone who was interested in that product backed the Kickstarter. And we spent all of this money developing a WordPress plugin that we would have been better off not developing. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> we would have been a failure. It would have been better off. It was a plugin for uh, professional speakers who wanted to show a calendar of their upcoming right. events. And it turned out there's a really narrow audience of people who were speaking enough where they wanted a calendar, but yeah. not so much that they had a personal assistant to do it for them. And that Got narrow it. band of speakers wasn't enough to support the plugin. And now the people who backed it loved it. They're like, oh my gosh, that's exactly right. what I was looking for. That tiny little gap of people. Yeah but it wasn't big enough and failure would have been better off in the long run. And I've had campaigns that have failed since then. Mm -hmm. And what I've appreciated is that it's very inexpensive place to fail. Mm. Like when you're I have started businesses and spent tens of thousands of dollars, fortunes on businesses that have failed. And I will tell you, I lost far less starting a business, testing the idea on Kickstarter yeah. than I did failing in real life. Like we made right. all the products. We found out there was bad product market fit. And uh, it, failure is educational, however, right? As yeah, entrepreneurs, you got to be okay with failure. But having failure be cheap is very valuable. Yes. <laughs> and, the nice, and, and by giving up a little bit of pride, mm -hmm. right? Because as people see you fail, you can save a lot of money. And if it thrives, you know, and you suddenly you find out your little fidget cube, actually there's like a million people who want that fidget cube. It's good to yeah. know that. So you can get a lot of factories in China making your fidget cube. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Kickstarter and uh, Indiegogo let you know about that as well. There's a lot more demand than you anticipated because that's the other risk is that you didn't make enough and you sell, sell out in 30 minutes and then it takes, you know, six months to get more from the fact right. you, you don't want that to happen either. Yeah. 
Okay, so for our listeners, if you're on the fence about using crowdfunding, just go for it. Take that risk because um, like Thomas just said, it's an inexpensive space to fail. So thank you so much, Thomas, for being here and sharing your wisdom on today's Thought Leader. Why don't you tell our Thought Leaders where they can find you online? So creativefundingshow.com, or if that's too much, it's creativefunding.show. I also have that domain <laughs> in every week or so. We give out basically a free 20-minute, 30-minute course on some aspect of crowdfunding, whether it's crowdfunding psychology, how to spread the word, how to craft your rewards. We talk about Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and it's all completely free uh, at creativefunding.show. That's so cool. Did you hear that, guys? It's all free so get on that again the note the links will be in the show notes thomas thank you so much for being here um and to our listeners thank you so much for joining us on this episode of today's thought leader where i'm challenging you to rise up speak up and create a movement be sure to drop a rating and review on itunes and if you have any questions for myself um, or for thomas reach out to us online my handle is at i am ruby see you back here next week for a brand new episode of today's thought leader